Robert Blake out on bail, a dramatic finish to the murder hearing held here at the Van Nuys Courthouse. We've got the details that led up to that decision, along with an inside look at Robert Blake's attorney, Thomas Mesereau. With background on the case you'll only find here on Court TV, plus the latest in celebrity legal news, this is Hollywood at Large. Tonight on Hollywood at Large, the Robert Blake murder hearing. We have the recap of what happened in the courtroom this week, and... I find difficulty with my own terrible self-destructive behavior. In one interview, a regretful Robert Blake looked back at his troubled past. We have this forgotten interview done long before the murder of Bonnie Lee Bakley. Plus, Wood at Large. Hello, everybody. I'm Wendy Walsh. Welcome to Hollywood at Large. Well, it was high drama in the court here Thursday at the conclusion of the Robert Blake murder hearing. For the latest on the events and the decisions, let's go to Court TV reporter Vinnie Politan. Thanks, Wendy. After 11 months in jail and after nine long days of arguments during his preliminary murder hearing, Robert Blake can hang up his prison garb for now. I am going to set bail at a million and a half dollars. Robert Blake struggles to regain his composure as Judge Nash grants him $1.5 million bail on Thursday. I just want to say that we are very grateful to Judge Nash for being courageous. Under the terms set by Judge Lloyd Nash, Blake must surrender his passport, wear an electronic monitoring device, stay confined to one residence, and not leave that residence during the murder trial. He described Mr. Blake as shaking like crazy, correct? Yes. But leading up to that emotional finish, earlier this week, the preliminary hearing revealed the first-hand accounts of Blake's actions on the night of Bonnie Lee Bakley's murder, the possibility of a money trail, and a gruesome catalog seized in a search of Earl Caldwell's property. There was a magazine or manual, as you may call it, called The Killing Zone, and it gave you principles and techniques of ambush and counter-ambush. Detective Thomas Matthew reported the catalog was dog-eared on pages to order The Killing Zone book, and another book on silencers, facts the defense was quick to discount. Is it illegal to obtain information regarding military silence to your knowledge? It's not illegal. Then Helga Shattuck, a manager of Blake's bank, told how City National Bank's internal security system flagged Blake's cash withdrawals of more than $2,500. We filed a suspicious activity report. Shattuck said Blake withdrew $126,000 in increments of $5,000 and less from September 2000 to March 2001. But his defense attorney said that's typical of anyone in show business, not proof Blake paid off a hitman. Is it unusual for someone in the entertainment industry to withdraw $5,000 from their account? No. But the most riveting testimony came from Detective Robert Bubb, a 21-year veteran of the Los Angeles Police Department. He helped investigators search Blake's house after the actor was arrested. Bubb reconstructed the last night of Bonnie Lee Bakley's life based on extensive interviews with Vitello's owners and staff. On that night, there was no indication there was anything out of the ordinary. Between uh, 9.15 and 9.20, uh, Mr. Blake asked for his check. And that's where the story gets confusing. A Vitello's waitress says she saw Blake mumbling and pulling his hair in the hallway. A customer reports Blake had thrown up in the bathroom. Other witnesses saw Blake and Bakley leave the restaurant and saw Blake return alone and upset minutes later. She described Mr. Blake as looking white as a sheep, correct? I believe she said that, yes. She said he looked like he had aged 50 years, correct? Yes, I believe she said that. Bubb recounted the dramatic statements of Sean Stanick, the man who dialed 911 for Blake. Stanick stood by as Bakley's life drained away. He tilted her head up and he recognized what he thought was a bullet wound on the uh, right side of her head. Stanick said Blake came running up with a nurse he found in Vitello's restaurant, but it was too late to save Bakley's life. He was holding Mr. Blake, true? Yes. And Mr. Blake said, I knew this was going to happen, true? Objection. Hearsay. Yes. Right? Yes. And he kept saying, God, God, I knew this was going to happen. True? Yes. Finally, on Thursday morning, the judge bound Blake and Caldwell over to trial. The jury would have to decide whether or not that's the conduct of a guilty individual or not. But for preliminary hearing purposes, it's sufficient. While most expected the Blake case to go to trial, the issue of bail for Robert Blake was not as clear cut. So Jaws dropped in the courtroom with defense attorney Thomas Mesereau's persuasive appeal to have Blake released on bail. 
It's being called yet another brilliant legal maneuver by a man who's managed to poke big holes in the prosecution's case. Unless somebody can show me something otherwise, and I'm still willing to, to listen, I do not believe that I have the legal authority to grant bail at this time. Things were looking bleak for Robert Blake until attorney Thomas Mesereau made another argument to the judge and convinced him to change his mind on the spot. You would not be violating the law or the spirit of the law if you were to grant reasonable bail to Mr. Blake based on what you've heard in this hearing. And I submit it would be the right thing to do, it would be the humane thing to do, and there is support for it. I am going to set bail at a million and a half dollars. It was another big courtroom moment for Thomas Mesereau, but there is another side to this high-profile attorney away from the spotlight. He is concerned with not only his personal being, but also with reaching out to help those that could not help themselves. Thomas Mesereau volunteers his time at a legal clinic inside this church. Ironically, it was through his work at the clinic that Mesereau met his famous client. And he says soon after meeting Robert Blake, the two became more than just lawyer and client. One of the reasons we, were, uh, we became friends and I became his lawyer is because he liked a lot of the work I do for disadvantaged people, for people who are up against it and have no money and no resources. Turns out Robert's done that his whole life. And while Mesereau now helps those who have been accused of crimes, at one time he was a prosecutor. But Mesereau says he was a misfit in the office who sometimes had difficulty convicting people like one young woman with a troubled past. When they arrested her, she looked for typewriter fluid to, to inhale. Um, she'd been physically abused, emotionally abused, sexually abused. I felt like giving her a hug and helping her out. I didn't want to convict her at all. But now Mesereau doesn't have to convict anyone, and he's happy with his role as a criminal defense attorney. As long as I'm fighting for justice, fighting for freedom, trying to make everyone get an equal shake in the system, I really feel good. Robert Blake and Earl Caldwell will be arraigned on March 27th. A trial date remains undetermined.